To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for their care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank everyone for joining our uh, session today. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Mark Solosky, who will be presenting on Lyme disease prevention, a summary and discussion of where we stand on Lyme vaccines and other immune-mediated approaches. Dr. Solosky is currently a professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and he holds joint appointments in the School of Medicine's Department of Pathology and Molecular Biology and Genetics, as well as the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology in the School of Public Health. He is also the co-director for basic research for the Johns Hopkins Lyme Disease Research Center. Dr. Solosky received his PhD in microbiology from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, and then completed postdoctoral training in immunology at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Dallas uh, Southwestern Medical School prior to joining the faculty at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in 1983. The overarching theme of his research is understanding how infection can lead to long-term persistent symptoms. At this time, working with Dr. John Alcott, the Director of Lyme Disease Research Center at Johns Hopkins, he is focusing on understanding how the immune system contributes to the symptoms and severity of human Lyme disease. He is very active and excited about the teaching of students at all levels about how the immune system evolved, how it protects us from infection, and how it can contribute to disease. We will have Dr. Solosky present, and then we will open from questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering them into the chat box or raising your hand using the icon or unmuting when the opportunity arises. Please help us welcome Dr. Solosky to the podium. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Veronica, for that very nice introduction. Thank everyone who has made this uh, series of talks possible. I popped into a few of them. I know you've heard from my colleague, John Alcott, last week. Um, hopefully I don't repeat some of the things that he says, although it's gonna be a few things that you might've seen last week. Um, and I wanna thank everyone who has made this possible, uh, the Canadian Lyme Disease Network and everyone else um, uh, that has uh, made this, um, this, uh, this uh, event during Lyme Disease Awareness Month. This is who I am, you've heard about that. I don't need to do anything more about that. I um, have nothing to disclose, although I'm asked to do such a thing. Uh, and this is what we're gonna do today while we're together. I'm gonna give you a general introduction on vaccines. I recognize that we probably have a very diverse audience here. And so I wanna get us all sort of used to the same kind of language. And I wanna shift over to, to Lyme disease and, and tell you about where we've been and where we're now going um, on Lyme disease vaccines for humans. Uh, there's some new approaches that are on the horizon for monoclonal antibody-based therapies. And I wanna share with you some of that. Uh, some, some gaps in knowledge, uh, and I'll be presenting some work from my own lab there, uh, and then talk about tick protein vaccines, a very interesting new approach that's sort of really in the laboratory now, but it's a wonderful idea, um, and we'll talk about that, and then we'll open the, uh, the, the conversation up for discussion until I guess they um, make a stop. So, this is just, I wanna give a shout out to our Lyme Disease Research Center at Hopkins. It really does take a village. Uh, there's a large number of colleagues uh, that are part of the work that we do both at Hopkins and different uh, nooks and crannies of Hopkins, as well as uh, some colleagues at other institutions um, all around the country. So uh, just start off now with a definition of what we mean by vaccination. Uh, it's really a process of induction of immunity to a pathogen, it could be a virus, it could be a bacteria, it could be a protozoan, by a deliberate injection of a weakened, modified, or related form of the pathogen, which is no longer pathogenic. That's the basic idea, is we're trying to bypass uh, people developing robust immunity because they, came, they got very sick. 
Um, and we're hoping that the, the vaccines that are developed uh, to various infectious diseases, uh, you know, allow people to generate robust protective immunity. So when they do encounter it for real, um, they have a immune response that can just be quickly harnessed and uh, where you might even never know that you actually got infected. So we'll talk about that in a couple more details, but the whole story of vaccination really kind of begins here with smallpox. You know, it was a devastating and horrible disease. At some time in our history, over 60% of humanity were infected with it, and it had an incredibly high mortality rate of 10 to 20%. It's caused by a virus called variola major. This is an electron micrographic picture of it. It's a very large DNA virus. It's kind of a complicated virus. And what you're seeing on the left is this poor gentleman who's uh, survived the infection, but you can see that his face is scarred from all the different pox marks that were um, that occurred because of it. So this was a scourge, you know, uh, on humanity. And so there was a lot of attempts to try to control this. And it turns out the smallpox has been around a long time. There was evidence from Egyptian mummies some, uh, in 1500 BC, as well as actual evidence from Ramses V, who died in 1100 BC, uh, that has been around a very long time. And that uh, people had figured out how to prevent it. They, they noted that if anybody had this disease, they never got it again. So somehow they were, quote, protected. So this is a little Chinese um, manuscript that's very old uh, where folks figured out that they had a kind of a treatment that worked. So they called it variolization, and it was done all over the world. Um, it's now recognized as it was done all over the world. And the idea was is to take the scrapings from those pox and then maybe dry it and, and then um, administer it to people. And so you just inject it into the skin. Well, what happened is there'd be an initial illness, um, hopefully a mild illness, but that they observed that if that happened, uh, that the individuals who were variolated would be um, uh, protected from it. So uh, it was something that, that uh, was widespread actually in the old world. Uh, when I mean by the old world, I mean Asia, Europe, as well as Africa, okay? Now, um, variolization was a very popular thing, actually, and there's an interesting tidbit of history. Uh, this is a picture of a fellow named Cotton Mather. He was a Puritan. Um, he was involved in the Salem witch trials. He was not a terribly enlightened gentleman. But to his credit, he um, uh, figured out how to prevent a smallpox uh, outbreak in Boston in 1721 when a ship arrived with had sailors which had smallpox. And everybody was afraid that there was gonna be this incredible new outbreak. Well, it turns out that he had uh, a slave named Osimius, and Osimius uh, told him about something that was very common from uh, uh, Western Africa where he was from is that they would have a little operation uh, where you give a little bit of the pox and would preserve him from it. And it was often used in widespread in West Africa. So Cotton Mather got collaborated with some of the physicians that were locally started to do this variolization. And he's credited actually with preventing a big outbreak in Boston at that time. Now variolization was a a common thing amongst the, the wealthy and, and uh, uh, folks, and they would have virilization parties. The downside is that yes, it would work, but also some people would get severely ill and die. So that wasn't a really good approach to do it. They had to figure out something better. So along comes this gentleman, William Jenner, Edward Jenner, I'm sorry. And he's considered the father of immunology. He was a physician in England in the late 1700s, and he was seeing a, a dairy maid uh, named Sarah Nels. And he noticed that she had on her hand pox that looked like um, smallpox, but they weren't smallpox. And so what he did is he took scrapings from them. And he also found out that Blossom, the cow that she was regularly milking, also had these little lesions on its udder. And for some really strange and weird reason, uh, Blossom the Cow's Hide is on display at St. George's Medical School in London in their library. So 
just a little trivia. Uh, and what he did was he took these scrapings from Sarah and then inoculated an eight-year-old boy. Imagine that, an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps. Okay. Now, he got a little bit sick, but he was fine after that. And then, of all things, he actually gave the, that young boy twice, actually, the real smallpox virus, and he was fine. Um, Jenner also vaccinated himself. These are clinical trials that we would not be able to do. But he gave birth to the whole idea of vaccination. And you know, from that developed all the vaccines that we know and, and, and love. Now, mind you, vaccination was controversial back then. Uh, this is an 1802 caricature of Jenner vaccinating patients and who feared that they would have sprout cow-like appendages from their arms, et cetera. So vaccination has been controversial um, and has been challenged by many uh, from the get-go. But the point I'd like to make is that vaccination worked in the case of smallpox through a worldwide effort. Uh, smallpox was officially eradicated um, in 1978. And, uh, and as far as I know, there have been no uh, cases of smallpox since then. So it was a case, it was an example where a tremendously terrible infectious disease was eliminated. There are lots of other uh, success stories of the theory of vaccines, polio vaccines, and measles virus vaccines as well uh, that, that uh, uh, were high, have been highly successful in, in controlling uh, infectious diseases. Sometimes measles pops up uh, when you know, pockets of groups of people are unvaccinated. Um, it's, you know, I want to point out this little yellow um, uh, part of the curve here. It's called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. It wasn't until 1968 or so where people realized this was a really, really bad complication of measles. It's sick. And it could occur when after the measles had gone away. And a few years later, suddenly these young children or these teenagers would have this terrible encephalitis occur. And it was um, it was a, a really devastating disease and it could have symptoms that last for a long time and actually had a high death rate. Fortunately, that has also gone down uh, once they recognize it and, and measles vaccines started happening. And in our modern day, this is a, 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 a telling uh, graph in which this is a COVID vaccine and this is the results in Italy. The gray line is the incidence of COVID-19 amongst an unvaccinated population. And the colored lines, the darkest green, are those who have had a vaccination and a booster, while the lighter green ones are just simply a one vaccination or just you know, maybe two vaccinations. So, so as you can see, it has helped in, in our modern times. So there are a lot of very, very, very successful vaccines. Okay. Now let's get on to Lyme disease. This is Lyme disease. Um, it is driven by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. It's the agent of Lyme disease in North America. There are other strains that um, drive it in Europe. Um, it's transmitted to humans by the saliva of a tick like this. This is the tick called Exodes scapularis in the eastern uh, part of North America and Exodes pacificus in the western part of North America. And uh, if this tick happens to have this spirochete inside of it, not all, not all Exodes do, but many do, uh, and it bites you for a sufficiently long period of time, it can drive Lyme disease. And this is a picture of one of the early reactions called the erythema migrans. Now, now it's a disease that's an uh, infectious disease that is increasing in incidence. Uh, back in 2001, the CDC in the United States reported 30,000 cases a year. Uh, most recently, there's, uh, the estimates are there's over 400,000 cases per year uh, centered here in the Northeast. I apologize for the white area up here uh, where they cut off Canada, but I may hopefully make up with that in the next few um, slides. So it's, it's hovering around the Northeast, it hovers around the Midwest, and there's another small sequelae out here in the West Coast. It's the number one vector-borne disease in the United States. Uh, here we are with uh, where, where uh, the America is whited out and here is Canada and this shows the instances, you know, where it's occurring in southern Ontario, uh, parts of Quebec, 
uh, also into the maritime provinces and also heading north from our Midwest here, I guess, um, in, into this area here. So, uh, and this is some highlights of that. So Lyme disease is a real concern for um, uh, the folks in Canada uh, as well. And climate change is, is making an impact. This is a model uh, which shows how uh, the spread of ticks will be occurring um, as in the past. We all know that uh, the black-legged tick uh, had been found in Southern Canada and in, uh, in Central Midwest Canada as well in central Canada, southern central Canada. And this is the near future where people think uh, it's going to be spreading even deeper into the maritime provinces further north in both of these regions. And the far future, the models are, are even for more uh, penetration. And we know that when the ticks start uh, finding new habitats, new habitats, new habitats, eventually we find that there are humans that, that are um, being having transmitted to them um, uh, tick-borne diseases. And tick-borne diseases is not just Lyme, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. but I should mention tick-borne ticks can, uh, uh, the black-legged tick especially, can, can transmit, <coughs> excuse me, several uh, kinds of bacteria for anaplasmosis and Ehrlichia uh, infection. And then there's also, they can uh, uh, do Barbiz uh, Babesia, uh, which is a protozoan and also a virus called Powassan, uh, Powassan virus, which was actually first identified in Powassan, Ontario from the brain of a, a young child who died of a very severe encephalitis. So these ticks can transmit several bacterial infections as well as um, um, viral and protozoan diseases as well. So it's really, you know, should be on everyone's radar and we should be concerned about it. Now we should be concerned about it as well because of the manifestations of this disease. Now, I, I know John Alcott probably showed you the exact same slide, but I'm just gonna mention a few things. It all begins with the tick bite. Now, every tick bite does not give Lyme disease. Sometimes the tick isn't infected. Sometimes the tick is not on long enough. But if it's on long enough and it is infected, there's a good chance that it's gonna initiate Lyme disease. And the beginning is this erythema migrans. This is a textbook version. It never quite looks like that. It can look, uh, uh, it can have lots of different manifestations. Sometimes it's not actually really obvious. Um, it can be faint. Uh, but in addition, not only does this happen with achiness and fever and fatigue, but uh, the bacteria begins to grow at the local site of the infection, but very quickly uh, leaves and, and runs into the blood and then disappears quickly from the blood, hanging out in different kinds of tissue like uh, uh, the central nervous nervous system and into the joints. And it can cause things like Bell's poly, kind of an early neurological disease, as well as muscle pains, et cetera. And there can be late manifestations of the disease as well, uh, where you can get a, a huge inflamed joint that can um, impact people's mobility. Now, this is the disease course of untreated Lyme disease, okay? So this is what would happen if someone got infected and either they weren't diagnosed properly, they just never felt that, oh, I don't feel sick enough to go to a doctor. Uh, or they were, uh, you know, probably maybe not treated properly as well. Uh, and so this is the, the time course um, of, of that. And this is a one, one very good reason because things get fall through the cracks, diagnoses fall through the cracks, not everybody seeks treatment. And, and, but these are the downstream events that can occur and they can have an enormous toll on the quality of life of individuals. So preventing that would be a great thing. Now, the good news is that we have, no matter what stage you're at in this disease, you can be treated with antibiotics. And for the most part, people get better. Now we've studied this over uh, 10 to 12 years at the Lyme Disease Research Center at Johns Hopkins. And we have these studies called SLICE studies, which is the study of Lyme disease immunology and clinical events, where we have followed people for a very long period of time. They come in, uh, and they have a rash. We make sure that that's one of the entrance into our studies that they, they have a rash on them. They also don't have any other confounding issues like fibromyalgia, uh, underlying autoimmune diseases, uh, 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 types of cancer, et cetera. So these are what we strive to be normie, he normal healthy people of a variety of different ages who come to us with, with Lyme disease. And they're treated with the oxycycline 
Um, and, and then we follow them over the years and over the years. And what we find out is that a lot of them return to health. That's great. You know, the antibiotics work, they go back to work, they feel absolutely fine, they have no uh, symptoms, uh, their quality of life, that's what QOL means, is, is absolutely normal. But we have another group who still have lingering symptoms. They just, it kind of hangs on, you know, it doesn't go away, they don't quite feel fit normal, they'll feel normal. And then there's even another group called, we call post-treatment Lyme disease, which we define at six months. And this is where not only do they have symptoms like musculoskeletal disease, uh, uh, pain or joint pain, or uh, they might also have um, uh, uh, memory uh, uh, issues, sleep issues, but also they have quality of life issues. So this is impacting the way they're functioning in day in and day out life. And this is called PTLD and it's a significant fraction and it's a cumulative number. Uh, so, you know, in the last 10 years, if over 10%, 14%, uh, 15% uh, of the people, and estimates have been as high as 20% are infected, we can, have, we can add you know, 30 to 60,000 new people um, every year. So over 10 years, you know, you're talking big numbers now, hundreds of thousands of people uh, who have this syndrome. So that's another important reason to kind of put the, put the kabang on Lyme disease. And just to mention this, I think John mentioned this last week, that the uh, PTLD um, is the quote symptoms is, is, is not just the hum of the population. It's significantly higher. Um, uh, normal people, uh, folks uh, was 4%. So we don't really know what drives PTLDS. I know that John mentioned several of the factors, immune dysregulation, persistent bacterial neural network analysis. But I do want to talk a little bit about the uh, life cycle of that drives the, of, the, of the tick that helps drive some of the features and some of the targets of some of the approaches that people are, are using for prevention. So it's a two-year life cycle. Um, the white-footed mouse, uh, the wild white-footed mouse, Paramyxis, is a major reservoir of Borrelia in the wild. It all begins with, of course, eggs that, eat, that uh, now in the spring are are, are hatching as larvae. Um, these larvae then need to take a blood meal. And they don't take a blood meal on humans, they take a blood meal on low uh, uh, animals that are low to the ground, like a mouse or squirrel or, or bird, actually, um, which uh, probably was why one of the major ways in which ticks in, were deposited in Southern Canada. The tick larvae feed on these smaller mammals and smaller animals. Um, and they, uh, the tick larvae, when it's hatched, when it's born, has no beryllium in it, but it will acquire it with this blood meal. So if it happens to have a blood meal on an animal that has beryllia in it, uh, and we know that there are a lot of mice out there that have beryllia in it, some 30% up to 95% in some really highly endemic areas. I don't know what it is in Canada, but I think I know that there are some folks up here that are investigating it. Um, uh, but that tick will feed, and then it will then go back and lay dormant in the vegetation, okay? So it'll feed on this mouse, uh, uh, then it'll get dormant, and in the following spring, it will emerge as a nymph. And this nymph is a rather aggressive creature. Uh, here's a picture of a nymph doing a behavior they call questing. It crawls on the top of vegetation, and it, and it looks for a CO2-emitting creature that go by. And so that's where uh, the deer can become infected. They take a, a blood meal on the deer uh, and, they, and that's where uh, humans can be infected as well. So in the spring into the summer is a time where there's lots of nymphs about and those nymphs can, can, um, it can end up um, uh, having a blood meal on, on many larger mammals, including us. Um, then uh, after that summer, the, after that blood meal, they turn into adults and these adults then molt uh, into their final form. They'll then um, uh, mate and then they'll produce more eggs. So that's the two year life cycle. And that helps explain the seasonality. So, you know, the Lyme disease increases in the late spring into the early summer. Uh, that's largely driven by nymphs, okay? Not larvae, but nymphs. 
then it begins to wane. And then we see a little persistence in the fall. And that's usually being driven by the adults having their little blood meal. Uh, and then things quiet down for the winter months until it, and this, this happens year in, year out. Now, let's go back to this life cycle. Where do we want to intervene? Well, some people uh, have devised some very clever strategies to control a tick. Okay? I'm not going to talk about that, but there are strategies out there that can reduce the incidence of ticks around. Uh, sometimes they involve using um, uh, certain kinds of, of, of insecticides that are Toward, uh, that are tick specific, or uh, there's actually a fungus that, that people have put out there that, that infects ticks and kills them. Um, sometimes they wanna get rid of the reservoir, like controlling the mice or getting rid of the deer. Controlling the mice has a lot of merit to it. Uh, there are some interesting ideas about that. We can uh, talk about if you want to, but controlling deer unfortunately does not. Uh, it's been shown in a number of different studies that lowering the deer population doesn't matter. Um, the, the ticks just go after other mammals <laughs> that are, are big. So, uh, so that doesn't work. But the other approach is to uh, do something to the human host so that if they get a tick bite, they're already um, at the point where they are going to get, uh, be able to do something, make an immune response that's going to prevent them from getting uh, Lyme disease. So that's where I'm going to spend you know, a goodly amount of time talking about now. So first, though, I'm going to get a little granular about Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi is a smart bacteria because it senses its, its environment. So when it is living inside of a tick, remember ticks are at room temperature, they have their own sort of levels of nutrients, their own pH, you know, tick biologists can, can talk about that at length. But when the, the bacteria is inside the tick, it covers itself with a protein called OSC, okay? I'm sorry, OSPE, my mistake, OSPE. So it's outside is covered with OSPE. So when this tick and when this tick bite occurs and the Borrelia is transmitted into the bacteria though, OSPE gets downregulated and another protein called OSC gets upregulated. So a lot of people thinking about generating a vaccine is what if we set up someone's immune response so that it made an immune response against OSPE so that it was ready there so that when somebody got you know, bit and, it, and the bacteria came in, there would already be existing, pre-existing immunity to a protein called OSPE, okay? And we're gonna talk about OSC as well uh, later on. So that's what indeed what people did. They generated a vaccine. So this is just a slide kind of illustrating the basic principles. The idea is, is to generate a pre-existing immune response so that when the tick takes its blood meal, there are antibodies present that can uh, initiate the neutralization and clearance of that bacteria. So you have a, what we call a primed host, you know, uh, ready to roll as opposed to one that has to develop its own immune, system, uh, immune response, which can take weeks, um, uh, 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 not a month. Okay. okay, so that's a target for prevention. So we had a Lyme disease vaccine. Uh, it was licensed in the United States in 1998. It was called Limerix. It used recombinant OSPE, uh, which was tapped to a, a lipid moiety to kind of make it soluble and with an adjuvant to stimulate immune responses. It was uh, pretty heavily studied uh, with over 11,000 subjects. It was done at multiple centers throughout the United States. Half of them got a placebo control. The other one got the real vaccine. 99% of the vaccine recipients developed antibodies to OSPE and it was highly effective. It was 83% in the first year and 100% in the second year. But unfortunately, at the same time that this group published this paper, a few months later, um, a similar uh, group also published a paper that in um, Lyme arthritis, uh, T cells that react to OSPE, so an immune response to OSPE, could also attack our own tissues. And so or with the in theory could attack our own tissues. Uh, it's never actually been proven that it actually happened. But because of that, you know, there were reports of lots of side effects and eventually um, they just removed it from the market due to all of these concerns. And the, plus the fact probably that nobody was buying it. So we have lied dormant 
um, since 2002 uh, and without a vaccine for humans, okay? Now, mind you, we can have a vaccine for our dogs, but we do not have a licensed human vaccine. That landscape is changing, I'm happy to say. So there was this, uh, a small company in France called Valeria, uh, and they developed a new vaccine. So the new vaccine contained not just a uh, OSPE protein from Borrelia burgdorferi, but a bunch of other variants of Borrelia that drive disease, not just in North America, but in Europe. So there would be a lot of interest in this. Not only that, they re remove by genetic engineering the part of the molecule that raised so much concern that it ended up getting removed because of side effects. They then tested this in many animal models and showed that, you know, an individual mice, et cetera, that generated this, they could generate very, very strong immune responses to this modified OSPE. And I'm happy to say that this uh, vaccine is now in advanced phase two trials. This is the information. You can get uh, more information if you go into the clinicaltrials.gov website. This is the identifier for it. And Valve Valneva and Pfizer have teamed up to announce this, uh, to, to, to do these, uh, these trials. And, um, and they're gonna use both adult and pediatric subjects. Uh, and they're trying to accelerate this to phase three and then eventually get it out on the market. And this is really uh, fantastic because, you know, we have not had a human Lyme disease vaccine. Um, this has been, this idea has been well received by uh, a number of different groups, including patient advocacy groups here in the United States. Um, and, you know, it's the only one right now that's in active clinical development. So it could be that in a year or two, uh, there might be available a Lyme disease vaccine that would uh, one, one would at risk populations or at risk individuals uh, could obtain. Okay. Now, 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 the other thing is that the landscape isn't sitting still. Some people think that, you know, okay, OSPE is good. We did that before. It seems to be working now, but you know, maybe we can even make a better vaccine. And one person who's promoting um, uh, sort of a new vaccine design is Rich Marconi at the uh, Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, Virginia. And what he added to the flavor is not just using the OSPE protein, uh, but adding the OSC protein. Now there's a twist in using that OSC protein. The twist in using it is that there are lots of serological variants and there's at least seven major ones. And he has spent a lot of time mapping where the antibodies bind to these particular variants. So if you generate a good immune response, what's the part that really matters? And so he's identified the parts that really matter in these particular variants, and he's generated a chimeric protein that has all of these things. And he's demonstrated beautifully with preclinical models that this produces robust protection. And in fact, you know, uh, our canine friends are the ones that are able to obtain this uh, first. And so it's a new recombinant vaccine that includes OSPE and OSC. Now, I know that Dr. Marconi is working very hard to translate this into the human setting and also not only include these proteins in a human um, uh, uh, type of trial, but also adding a few other proteins from other tick-borne diseases as well. So one might be able to get a vaccine that would be um, capable of protecting not just against Lyme disease, but a few other tick-borne diseases as well. So that's, you know, I just wanted to assure you that the landscape is not stagnant. It's actually very dynamic and people are trying many different things. In fact, there are lots of grants that are funded by the National Institute of Health using other kinds of vaccine strategies as well. So I want to spend a lot of time on them, but just to realize that this is a very active area of investigation. Now, what about monoclonal antibodies as a treatment? and pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now we know about monoclonal antibody therapy. We've heard about it in the context of COVID-19 where there's a monoclonal antibody that, uh, developed by um, Regeneron. And this antibody uh, has been used to, uh, to treat uh, COVID-19. It's a human antibody um, that was developed in a mouse. 
Um, and this human antibody uh, can be infused into individuals and it has a positive therapeutic effect. Okay, so um, a similar approach has been done with the Borrelia burgdorferi OSPE protein. So humanized mice, now we'll mention that humanized mice is not a talking mouse, it is a mouse that has been genetically engineered where the mouse genes that make antibodies have been replaced by the human counterparts of them. So that when this mouse makes an immune response, it's actually making it with actual human antibodies. So they generated a whole bunch of monoclonal antibodies. They selected four of them because they were really, 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 really active against Borrelia. They showed they could protect, uh, protect mice from tick-mediated infection. And they chose one that was particularly good because it re reacted not just with Borrelia, but with other variants of Borrelia that drive uh, disease. So this was about four or five years ago that they did this. This is fantastic. They then mutated the virus and they actually showed that it could protect um, uh, non-human primates. Okay, so rhesus macaques received this monoclonal antibody, and then they were infected with uh, Borrelia-infected ticks, and they observed a high degree of protection. Now, this has moved from the laboratory, the preclinical setting, into the real human setting with clinical trials. Mass Biologics uh, and Celerion have teamed up, and they are now doing the first clinical study of the safety and blood levels of a human monoclonal antibody against Lyme disease bacteria and using healthy people. So this is something that's happening. Again, this, you can get some more information about this if you want at clinicaltrials.gov. So this is another therapeutic approach using, again, this OSP-A protein as the, um, as the target of it. And, you know, uh, they, have, they are proposing that this can not only be used perhaps as a treatment, uh, during Lyme disease for maybe especially bad cases, but also could possibly be infused uh, before people got infected to particularly at-risk individuals, okay? All right. So um, OSPE and a little bit of OSPE are being targeted now for a lot of immune-mediated strategies. But now I just want to raise another point. Are there other important uh, targets for Lyme disease. And I say there might be. The reason I say it is on the left here is a cartoon of the Borrelia genome. It's a strange bacterial genome in that it contains a linear, large linear chromosome, a bunch of all small linear plasmids and a bunch of circular plasmids. It encodes approximately 1800 genes, which we believe so far will encode about 1300 proteins. OSC and OSC a are but two of that 1300, okay? Um, so my other proteins encoded by this incredibly complicated genome, the immune targets? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, on the right here is something we, we, call, we call a protein blot or a protein array. On this array was placed a whole bunch of brilliant encoded proteins, some of which we know about, and have, people have studied, some of which we have no idea what they are, and they're just open reedy frames, hypothetical proteins. They were spotted on a membrane, and then that membrane was probed with serum from patients here, or serum from controls. You can see the right-hand side where the controls are, it's either light green, or really weak reaction, or it's dark where there's no reaction. But on the left, there is antibody reactivity to a wide variety of these proteins, many of which, all of which are, are not, there is OSC and OSPE there, but there's lots of other immune reactivity. Which ones of these are actually, are they better immune targets? We just don't know. Some people have shown that there, some of these antigens can be highly protective in mice, but we need to kind of study this a little bit more. Uh, there's lots of hints that the immune and immune response targets lots of different antigens. This is work that our group did in collaboration, well, Bill Robinson did in collaboration with our group, Bill Robinson in Stanford, 
And they identified individual B cells that were react to Lyme disease, you know, that react, um, were activated in Lyme disease. And then he cloned the, the B cell receptors, the antibodies that were reactive in those cells, and then tested what they reacted with. And the short of it is, yeah, okay, you developed an antibody against Off-C, but you also developed proteins, uh, antibodies against other proteins. And these proteins were highly effective in neutralizing the bacteria. So this raises the question that there might be other immune targets out there and that we should know what they are. The other thing that's important is that as part of any robust immune response is the T cell plays an incredibly important role. The T cell activation of CD4 T cells, these are helper T cells, they activate the B cell to produce these, uh, these high affinity uh, antibody molecules. Okay, and we know a little bit about the T cells that these react to. Uh, most of the T cells in Lyme disease that have been described so far have, have reacted to the protein OSPE, but there is some evidence that other proteins might be involved in that. And people in the COVID-19 area in the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine has said, you know, we might be able to even do a better job if we include in our vaccine, making sure that the T cells become activated as well as neutralizing the antibody, because T cells are very important in controlling viral infections. And we know also the CD4 T cells are particularly important in controlling uh, bacterial infections as well. So that piece needs to be thought about, you know, as we move forward, perhaps designing better and better vaccines for many bacterial pathogens, including Borrelia burgdorferi. About um, uh, th this particular uh, signal here, we refer to as signal one. So Borrelia burgdorferi deposits, I mean, uh, the tick deposits Borrelia burgdorferi into the A cell called a dendritic cell. It eats Borrelia. And surface associated with um, or associated with an MHC molecule called an MHC class two. Off those peptides to T cells, and those T cells will become activated. Uh, uh, Gutierrez Hoffman did is to try to figure out. You know, what are the, these little red things? What are these peptides that are in the groove here? Are there a lot of them or just a few? Maybe they're all from OSPE or an OSC. You know, maybe they're not from other kinds of proteins and it's been figured out. So what she did is she took these cells, uh, these antigen processing presenting cells, dendritic, human uh, dendritic cells. We exposed them to Borrelia for 24 hours. We let Borrelia eat it and then chop it up into little short peptide pieces, those little, little red dots. We then lysed the cell, purified the class two molecules, separated out the peptides, eluded them, and then sequenced them using a mass spectroscopy-based approach. And we found that there were lots of peptides in there. But interestingly enough, when these Borrelia, when we, these cells were uh, fed Borrelia, there were a bunch of peptides that were derived from known genes encoded by Borrelia burgdorferi. And this is just a list of them. Some of them are things we knew about, but the vast majority of them are proteins that we didn't even think about as being important in um, our, our uh, as being important in uh, as an immune target in uh, in Lyme disease. And this is just a slide showing you, yeah, we get OSPE, we get Fagellin, but we get all these other proteins as well. And these are different individuals. So so it's not just happening in one individual; it's happening in a lot of people. And this is just an example of a protein called P66, of which we know nothing about the T cell immune response. These are the peptides that are derived from one donor, okay? But these are from a variety of different donors. And you can see that, you know, each donor has its own unique sort of peptide fingerprint. In addition, there are many peptides that are found in many donors as well. So it could be that these kinds of peptides or recombinant proteins that contain these peptides can be really good in stimulating CD4 responses and making robust high affinity protective antibody response in vaccines. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears now and move into the world of ticks. Now, as I mentioned before, ticks have a blood meal. Okay, and people have hypothesized over the years, if we can figure out a way to interfere with that, 
you know, not with an insecticide, not with covering ourselves up with DEET, but actually have someone have an immune response that's reactive to ticks. Now that's not so preposterous. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence that forestry workers uh, would, would anecdotally say to physicians that, yeah, I used to get tick, bit by ticks a lot, but no more. I mean, they just stopped tick biting me. So well, why would that be the case? Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that. So the whole idea here is to generate antibodies against tick proteins, making the tick kind of not feel well or detach itself or to do something um, that would then interrupt with this particular tick bite when it occurs. Now, ticks, proteins have very important biological effects that actually help Borrelia set up shop and it also uh, helps the tick stay on you for, um, uh, you know, for a couple of days. It's not like a from 48 to 72 hours. It's not here and gone like a with all of these proteins in there, okay? And then what uh, Lyndon Yu and his colleagues at Tufts showed that it um, called Siblosin and it's, it's on this inflammation around the tick bite. Okay. And uh, it interferes with tick feeding and the transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi. So that was an animal model success. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, this group here, and this is from a European group uh, where they had sera from forestry workers, and they actually identified in the sera of these forestry workers antibodies that recognize certain kinds of exodes. Uh, proteins in, in the salivary gland. And some of these antibodies uh, or these antigens could be used in a vaccination study to protect. Now, this has been approached a little bit more systematically by, a, by Errol Fickering's lab at Yale University. And they develop a messenger RNA-based vaccination. Remember Moderna and Pfizer used a messenger RNA-based platform? Well, he used a messenger RNA-based based platform uh, expressing several exodium scapularis salivary proteins. That's the one that's driving our disease here in North America. He used a guinea pig model because when guinea pigs get bit by ticks, they have a big inflammatory response, okay? And, and they have an erythema migrans. What he found is when um, these guinea pigs were immunized, they got a really exaggerated erythema migrans provoked versus the controls. And this is the left, you know, the exaggerated erythema migrans. You see the inflammation there. And this is the right with some ticks on them. And what you can see on the left is you see erythema migrans, but the ticks are actually detaching very quickly. They have lower engorgement and they had inefficient transmission of Borrelia. Now, this is a really interesting approach and this is still really in the laboratory. So we're a ways away. But it's a really interesting approach because not only uh, could this prevent the transmission of Lyme disease, but this kind of approach, if a tick-based vaccine could be made and you're at an at-risk um, uh, population in, an, uh, in the tick, very tick endemic area, um, then you could, uh, a vaccine could not only protect against Borrelia, but all those other uh, bacterial, protozoan, and viral infections that can be tra transmitted by this tick. So, I think it's a really something to keep your uh, thumb on to see how this develops, because this could be a really important area. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we open up for questions is the use of an antibiotic. Now, this is a really controversial thing. A lot of people don't like to use antibiotics to treat just when you get a tick bite. And the reasons are several fold. Um, you know, um, one is, you know, we don't want to generate antibiotic resistant bacteria. Well, there is no evidence that antibiotic treatment generates antibiotic resistant bacteria in Borrelia. No one's ever found a doxycycline resistant bacteria. But uh, you can uh, also upset the microbiome. So that's another, you know, uh, a reasonably good argument for not, you know, giving antibiotics. Well, what Kim Lewis's group at Northeastern did, and this is a very recent paper from him, is he looked at soil producing bacteria to try to identify some natural substances that would um, interfere with Borrelia burgdorferi. 
and he found it. And he found that he had discovered a molecule that we knew about already called hygromycin A. Now, hygromycin A was particularly good against Borrelia and not that good against lots of other bacteria as well. Um, and, and not only that, well, uh, it, 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 if you treated uh, them, you would, uh, with hygromycin A, you could completely block transmission of Borrelia um, uh, into uh, a mouse. And also, very importantly, uh, you also did not alter the microbiome. So again, this is a mouse, it's not a human, but it suggests that perhaps a few antibiotics might be able to be used uh, very carefully and, and in a controlled fashion to uh, help protect folks um, against a um, infection from a tick bite um, in a prophylactic manner. So uh, again, this is very much in the laboratory phase, but it certainly opens up as a possibility and that's discussed in this particular paper. So I am going to now stop. I'm going to entertain any questions that might uh, that people might have, and then I am going to stop my share, uh, and then do my best to answer the queries that are out there. Thank you, Dr. Soloski. Uh, we don't have any uh, questions in the chat box yet. However, if you'd like to ask a question, um, please raise your icon, your hand icon, or unmute and go ahead and ask Dr. Soloski a question. I see MJVA40, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, uh, this is Martin Bordeaux. Um, thanks a lot for your talk, really interesting. Uh, I was wondering about the, the monoclonal antibody treatments that yes. um, you were you were talking about. And uh, did you mention that they were targeting OSPA? Is that right? Yes, they are. They they target the OSPA protein. Right. But that's then, the um, that's that's what they're that's what it does. Okay. The high affinity antibody's been engineered, so it also has a changed FC receptor. So it'll be really good binding the phagocytes. And so when it grabs on the bacteria, they get eaten. So I could see how that, that could prevent infection, but in a person that is infected, I, I thought OSPE is not so much expressed inside the You're right, person. you're right. Yeah, this, this is particularly thought of as a prophylactic approach. Now, having said that, there is data out there that OSPE may get re-expressed in the host at some time if it's lingering around. And the reason I say that is um, when you look at these late Lyme disease arthritis, um, the T cell responses that have been characterized that are found in the joint, just in the joint, are reactive to OSPE. So that you know, may mean, well, it's not quite so quiet, isn't it, if the immune response is being made against it. So I think that the, maybe the, the dogma is a little loose. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, although I, I guess I would think maybe in that case you wouldn't, there might be a subset of the population that expressing OSPE in the patient, but not maybe all spirochetes. Right, you're right, you're right, you're right. It, which is why, you know, I've sort of, uh, you know, st stood on my box and said, you know, we got to make sure we have more immune targets. You know, we can't right. just rely on one because, you know, there are these nuanced gene expression patterns for OSPE and OSC. Right. And, you know, maybe if we have a multivalent vaccine, uh, that would be, uh, you know, really a, a fantastic approach. Um, right. But that's going to take a while and it's down the road. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, You're Dr. Welcome. Bordeaux, for your question. Uh, do we have any other questions from our audience? Don't be shy. Raise your icon or unmute and go ahead and ask Dr. Soloski a question. Uh, there was one question here. Could a few of the patients that received the Lyme Erix already have had Lyme? Um, they were tested to make sure they were Lyme naive before they could enter into the study. So, uh, but you're right, the, the test is not great <laughs> at the time. So, you know, a couple of the, the people could have, there's, there is a hum and there is a question whether, you know, is there a certain fraction of people who have encountered uh, Borrelia burgdorferi and then spontaneously cured themselves, you know, and which sort of it, it's, uh, you know, does, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, do you, does it make a sound kind of thing? Um, so, you know, I think we have to be open to those things. 
Thank you, Dr. Soleski, for letting us know and that. You, and you know, you're right. The diagnostics is 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 uh, complicated these days um, in two tier testing, and uh, we, they, they miss a lot of people, especially in the very early acute phases. Okay. Uh, Twyla, I see Twyla's got her hand up. Twyla, go ahead and ask your question or comment for Dr. Soloski. Oh, thank you, Veronica. And thank you, Dr. Soloski, for uh, a really terrific presentation. The question I have is with regard to neuroborrelia, mm. um, where the uh, uh, the pathogen is expressed, you know, in the central nervous system, and, you know, you don't get the EMs, you don't get um, the neuro, the muscular or other symptoms until much, much later after it spread. So my question mm. is, would these um, possible vaccines be effective in that case when the spread is through this, the nervous system as opposed through serological pathways? Right. I, I think that uh, you raise a great point that these may not be effective in treating those downstream, um, either the vaccine or the monoclonals, because uh, as we talked about it, they're just targeted to OSPE. And it's not clear to me that OSPE is expressed, you know, when Borrelia is in the central nervous system. So I, I think that, you know, we still need further development. I know that the trials are not targeting neuroborreliosis. I think it's baby steps right now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, you know, whenever you, uh, you know, trying to do a human trial, you try to be very careful and have a targeted population. Thank you, Twyla. That's for an excellent question. question. Yeah. Do we have, we have time for uh, one or two additional questions for Dr. Soloski? Does anybody else? Oh, go ahead, Dr. Vardo. I see your hands up again. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, so I wanted to also ask you, so you said that um, there's this, you know, new OSPE vaccine uh, being developed in Europe, and mm -hmm. that's, that's really exciting. Uh, and, again, and again, you mentioned that, uh, pre you know, previously OSPE might be expressed in, in chronic patients. But I, I, I seem to recall what, one of the problems, not problems, but one of the concerns with the original OSPE vaccine is if, if the antigen is mostly expressed by the spirochetes and the ticks, then the vertebrate host doesn't see it, right? And so you don't have this I forget what the word is, is the am amnestic response. So, so there's no uh, reminding of the, of, the, of the vertebrate immune memory uh, mm -hmm. when you get bitten by ticks. So do you think that for these vaccines, these OSPE-based vaccines, that, that people will have to get vaccinated sort of every year to keep the antibody levels high? Because you need pretty good antibody levels to prevent um, uh, the, the spirochetes from getting in, from the tick into you. Right, and so you're not, but you don't right. see antigen. You don't see the antigen itself. The vertebrate host doesn't see the OSPE antigen so much. So it means that it would constantly, mm. every year, you would have to be vaccinated to have the high, sufficiently high titers to protect yourself against a tick bite. Is that is that right? Correct? Yes, you make you make a good point. And in the original Limerix um, vaccination trials, um, they the the uh, folks received two doses, and that second dose made it. 100% effective. So that would suggest that you would need, you know, multiple immunizations to kind of keep it, keep it going. Because um, it, would, it would wane otherwise over, over time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You'd, you'd have lower and lower, and lower levels of neutralizing antibodies. Right. Okay. So, and so there's not, with this new vaccine, they haven't really thought of a way to get around that problem. It will probably be that you have to get immunized on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. And it may end up that, you know, this vaccine is made available to, uh, it's not just Europe, this is actually the clinical, the, the uh, trials are going on in, in uh, the United States as well. Um, and the FDA is, in theory, pushing it, <laughs> although it's been distracted recently. Um, uh, and uh, the, um, you know, it, it's, solely looking to see whether or not when they do a final, you know, uh, phase three trial, they'll probably do it multi-center, you know, 
use tens of thousands of individuals and and you know um, and check it out that way. Right. And it, you know, short term and long term immunity are, are are issues to grapple with for every vaccine. Yeah, yeah. But now that there's such good proof coming out that you know, by, by your by your research group and and the other speaker that we had the other day, that there's these long term chronic effects that are you know definitely tied to this post treatment Lyme syndrome. I mean, I get that there's mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of interest, I think, in getting a vaccine, right? Because you can't rely on antibiotics. Uh, I mean, antibiotics will clear the infection in most people, but in a significant mm -hmm. subsection, people will suffer from disease for long periods of time. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the challenges for us is to figure out who is, you know, really the most people at risk for developing those long term issues. And, right. and, and uh, so. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again, Dr. Verdo, for your question. Um, we can take one final question if anybody has a question before we wrap up today's presentation with Dr. Solowski. Um, if anybody has a question, don't be shy. Uh, Unmic or raise your icon. Just doing a quick look to see. Well, that looks like that might be, have been our last question for today, Dr. Solowski. Thank okay. you again for such your informative. It was a pleasure. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for hanging, hanging in there with me. And I do appreciate um, uh, this opportunity. And Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Solowski. Okay. Uh, I do want to remind everybody on the call that we do have a presentation tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern time. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Morshat will be presenting on passive tick surveillance in BC. What have we learned so far? So hope you can join us at tomorrow for Dr. Morshet's presentation. As a reminder, we are still taking, hoping you can take part in our challenge this month. Wear green or wear a green face mask. Take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness for Lyme disease. You can also send in uh, pieces or photos of your artwork or creativity if you don't want to send a photo image in of yourself. Um, all entries we receive will be automatically entered into a draw for one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. And our draw will take place um, after our final presentation on May 31st. And you can send your photos into Collidron at gmail.com. Again, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. Um, we will hopefully catch you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Take care.